Okay, I've entitled my message today, um, Multiplying God's Work. Multiplying God's Work, which is taken from Acts chapter 6, when the work of the growing church was too much for the apostles to handle. And therefore, the church encountered an unpleasant situation as it grew, and things came to a point when it was no longer feasible for the 12 apostles to handle some of these matters. And so we realize in Acts chapter 6 that they had to appoint new leaders, new helpers to take care of some aspects of the ministry so that they could focus on the ministry of prayer and the ministry of God's Word. And with that, we realize that God's mission for the church was more effectively accomplished. And so our passage today uh, really teaches us some essential keys for God's work and the kingdom of God to advance and to multiply. Uh, some of us may find this interesting because there are often two extremes when people talk about planning and organizing as a church and in spiritual matters. Uh, one group uh, will say things like, when God wants to do something, uh, He will supernaturally put everything in place and we don't need to do anything. I remember a friend, a friend of mine who's pastoring at a, a church, uh, he's leading the youth service, and this guy came and he, he, gave, he gave a word and he said, you know what, oh, when God's spirit comes, people will just walk into the doors uh, and, and you don't need to do anything. And I think my friend who was organizing all these things, he was thinking, wow, don't need usher, don't need signboard, don't need all these things. There's still some need for preparation, right? So some people think of things that way, um, but another group, will put all the emphasis on rigorous planning. Uh, we are to apply our minds or skills to create the best outcome that we can. And therefore, there's no need to pray or to discern what to do. So this other extreme believes this way. But what we realize in this passage is that God does work supernaturally, but He often does so through people whom He has appointed, gifted, and anointed with the Holy Spirit. And as uh, the church appointed wise and spirit-filled servant leaders, the gospel advanced even more as the apostles or the pastors focused on the ministry of the word and of prayer. In one sense, uh, we can think of it like an architectural or building plan. Um, when proper planning was done, with the right pillars, the right structures, the materials were put in place, um, God began to fill that place with an even greater blessing. Amen? I invite us to turn to Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. Let us read. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick up from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Amen. Now let's remember a few things as we look at this passage today. Um, the early church in Acts was growing and experiencing a wonderful move of God after the day of Pentecost. Uh, the gospel was being preached and people were drawn to God as the Holy Spirit worked among them. 
In fact, there were multiple ways of salvation and church growth in the first five chapters of Acts. And we know that the, first, uh, the, the early church became a community that transcended social boundaries of class and wealth. And people from different walks of life gathered to worship God and to break bread together. And we know that the disciples gave sacrificially. Some even sold properties to help those who were in need among them. Uh, but in chapter 5, we remember that with these changes came growing pains. Uh, they had to learn about the holiness of God, the hard way, when people like Ananias and Sapphira were judged for their sin. And so now we come to uh, chapter 6, and another incident arose regarding the church's ministry to the needy. And so we'll look at three things from this passage as we think about this idea of multiplying God's work. The church is an intercultural community, the appointment of leaders and the ministry of word and prayer. First, um, the church as an intercultural community. Uh, what I mean by this is that the church's identity is to be a community of different people groups, where people from different backgrounds and cultures uh, come together. But we are told here in verse 1 uh, that, that, that there was a dispute between groups. It says that when the disciples were increasing in number, people were getting saved. But a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Uh, the New American Standard gives, I think, gives a clearer sense of this by describing the two groups as the Hellenistic Jews and the native Hebrews. The Hellenistic Jews and the native Hebrews. Uh, so who were the Hellenistic Jews? They were actually uh, ethnic Jews, okay? They were actually ethnic Jews, but who were part of the Jewish diaspora, meaning they had been dispersed in the surrounding region. And they had, many of them had grown up in that area. They had been exposed to the cultures around them. But many of them had come back to Jerusalem uh, to live. And so from this group of Hellenists, many of them had come to know the Lord and become followers of Jesus. This group spoke mainly Greek uh, and were culturally different from the native Hebrews here. Uh, the native Hebrews, on the other hand, were Jews who had grown up in or around Jerusalem. And therefore, they were familiar with the local Jewish culture. Um, they could probably speak a bit of Greek, but most often they would speak Aramaic, which was the common dialect in Jerusalem. And so we realize from this very start, from this very first verse, that uh, there were cultural differences that probably led to tension between the two groups. Uh, many of us here uh, living in Singapore have probably watched uh, Chinese uh, kung fu movies at some point. Okay, I, I'm not promoting them, I'm not advocating that, but, I'm, uh, but I think many of us know that one common thing that happens in these movies will be that one group or one sect will claim to be the more original among them, the more zhen zhong, you know, uh, that they practice the purer form of, of a certain uh, kung fu, okay? Uh, and, and we realized that so the, there were tensions between uh, groups that were closely related but not entirely similar. Okay, there, it's very often that we see in life, there are tensions between groups that are closely related but not entirely similar. And so we, we can imagine there was probably a similar kind of cultural tension between the two groups of Jews when they came together to worship. We are told that there was a complaint that some of the Hellenistic widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. Uh, widows back then uh, were a particularly uh, vulnerable group of people. Uh, their lives were typically uh, very difficult after their husbands passed away, and there were few opportunities for them uh, to make a living. And so, if, especially if those widows didn't have uh, families living around them, uh, they would um, be in a very difficult economic situation. 
And, and that's why we, we know and we, many of us can remember even in Old Testament and also in the New Testament, God gave many commands in the Bible about taking care of the widow among you, right? Taking care of the widow among you. And so that's a good thing to do. But as they did this ministry, uh, the Hellenists felt that their widows were not treated fairly in the food distribution. Maybe they were given less or maybe they quickly given out and by the time their widows went, you know, uh, they, there wasn't enough left for them. And it needed to be brought to the apostles' attention. Uh, looking at this, I, I think in our, in our day and age today, uh, many people will immediately think that this is some kind of a, a systemic discrimination or systemic racism. But actually, this doesn't seem to be the case here. It's more likely a case of unintentional neglect or insensitivity uh, displayed by a small group. Okay? It's more likely a case of unintentional neglect or insensitivity uh, displayed by a small group. There are two reasons for this. The first is that in verse 1, um, the word translated neglected here in the original language uh, really means the idea, really carries the idea of paying insufficient attention, paying insufficient attention or overlooking something. Okay, the word translated neglected carries the idea of paying insufficient attention or overlooking something. In other words, it's more likely due to callousness or insensitivity that this minority uh, were, were accidentally overlooked. Uh, perhaps some of us might relate like a parent with too many things to do at certain points. Or uh, you're at work and a certain department is overwhelmed when business is at its peak period. So that's, that's one reason. The second reason is really found um, in verse 5 when they chose seven men. It said that what they, ple what they said pleased the whole gathering and the whole gathering agreed to choose these seven men. And what may not be clear to us as Singaporeans looking at this list is that these seven men all had Greek names. All these names that you see here, Steph Stephen, uh, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, uh, and all these, these are all Greek names. And so, um, Craig Keener, he's a respected uh, New Testament scholar, he, he made this observation. Uh, he, he, he said that in Rome during that time, under 40% of the Jews, only under 40% of the Jews had any Greek in their name. And only one or two of the apostles had a Greek name. That all seven of these men have Greek names suggests that they are all known to be Hellenists. Meaning to say they are first or second generation Jewish immigrants that have come back to Jerusalem. One of them is even a proselyte, okay? Uh, who is meaning to say he was a former Gentile who had converted to Judaism. So these, these four men, in other words, all these men were from the Hellenistic community and one was a converted Gentile. And yet verse 5 tells us that the whole gathering, including the native Jews, agreed to their appointment. The whole gathering agreed. They, they will not have, my point is that they would not have done so if there was widespread bias against the Hellenistic Jews. In fact, by agreeing, uh, by affirming the selection of seven Hellenistic Jews, we realize that the native Jews actually showed preference uh, to the Hellenists after this complaint. And so we realized that um, uh, it, 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 this, this wasn't a case of intentional or, or a prejudice or discrimination. But the, the, in fact, the, the, um, the Jewish, the Hebrew-speaking Jews were eager to, to uh, help them and to appoint them and to solve this problem with them. And in one sense, we realized that uh, this conflict, this conflict of cultures, so to speak, helped to prepare the early church to reach out to people groups nations and cultures that will be increasingly difficult from them. And many of us know that, uh, that the church has a missionary calling and the origin of this idea is really found in God's covenant with Abraham. Uh, in Genesis chapter 12, 
God spoke to Abraham and He said, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who honors, dishonors you, I will curse. But He says this, And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abraham had this, uh, uh, in a sense, missional calling, but he only saw a portion of this fulfilled in his own lifetime. It would be his descendants, those who follow God by faith, that would carry this message or this prophecy to its fulfillment. God's intention was that one day the families of this, this earth, even those who are not Jewish, will be blessed. And therefore we come to the New Testament and even Jesus uh, told the, his disciples in Acts chapter 1 of this intercultural mission. Jesus said that you will receive power from the, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You can imagine that, 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 that the verse right there is, is like a, a concentric circle. First you start in Jerusalem, then you go to Judea and Samaria, and then you spread to the ends of the earth. And so the progression here that Jesus uh, calling for the church, uh, God's calling for the church is very clear. Um, that the apostles and the church were to engage peoples, people groups and cultures that were increasingly less and less Jewish. In, fact, in other words, not kakinang. You know, they were increasingly less and less Jewish. And in, in, in this incident in chapter 6, God was preparing them to handle some of these intercultural issues and misunderstandings that can happen as the gospel spread. And we can imagine that if they didn't learn this lesson, if they did not learn to accommodate the needs of these people, that God had brought, and not just brought, had saved in, and brought into the church, they would not have fared well when God called them to reach people from other cultures that would be even more different. Amen? Uh, what does this mean for us today? Uh, for a start, we should remember that our church, God's church, is to be an intercultural community on God's mission. There is a mission that God has called us to, to bring the gospel further and further out to people who have not heard Him. That's why we do things like our Christmas outreaches and so on. But the thing we remember is that as we do so, we need to be adaptable and flexible in certain areas. Like new wineskins, you know. We need to be adaptable and flexible in certain areas. I'm not talking about essential things, essential beliefs of the faith. I'm not talking about moral issues. Those things are things we do not compromise on. But there's a certain flexibility and, and adaptability that, that's required. We have to be willing to accommodate and engage with people who are different from us in culture, in background, who may talk or behave differently from what you are used to. Uh, of course, in, in Singapore, in our church, it may not always be like, a, it, there is some, but it, sometimes it may not be just a difference of cultures or ethnicity. But surely there are many different, uh, we have people from different backgrounds, different age ranges, different personalities. And those are points of conflict and sometimes differences that we need to learn to navigate through as a community. And this, uh, I remind us, is a part of expressing the love of God who created different ethnicities, different languages, different cultures, different personalities. This is part of expressing the love of God who made people different from you in terms of background and preferences. In fact, if we don't get this right, if we don't get this right, you know, our, our church and our, our community groups can become an inward-looking war zone. 
you know, inward-looking war zone instead of a missional and evangelistic church. You know, instead of our church becoming a, a gathering place, we become a battlefield. And instead of offering others the right hand of fellowship, we give others a kick with our left foot. Instead of speaking God's truth in love, we bicker over unimportant things. Instead of preferring one another, we magnify our own preferences and prejudices. If this happens, we cannot effectively reach out to others. God's work cannot be multiplied if we forget this truth and we start being inward-looking as a church. And so this, I think that's something that we need to uh, take hold of as we think about this season, uh, as we come to work Christmas and our outreaches uh, this year, and even not just beyond, even beyond Christmas, as you think about the way you live your lives in your workplaces, in your families, in the communities that God has put you in. We are called to be a missional and evangelistic people. The second thing we realize is that uh, there is a need to appoint servant leaders. Uh, there is a, the appointment of new servant leaders is required. In other words, uh, ministry responsibilities needed to be shared in order to expand God's work. Ministry responsibilities needed to be shared in order to expand God's work. It wasn't that uh, the apostles were unwilling to serve tables. Remember, they had they themselves had Jesus wash their feet, right? So it wasn't that the apostles themselves were unwilling to serve tables, but that the church had grown to a point where it was no longer feasible to do so without compromising on God's word and on prayer. And so we see in verse 3, the apostles recommended the appointment of new servant leaders to oversee this work and to share the responsibilities of ministry. Of course, this isn't the first time, okay, in God's Word where responsibilities needed to be delegated and shared. Uh, we can remember the example of Moses. Uh, he had to lead a nation. And so what happened in Exodus 18 was that people were queuing up for long hours Okay, to have Moses judge their disputes and to give them advice. Uh, and so when, when Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, saw this, uh, he told Moses, you know, he told Moses in Exodus 18, what you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Therefore, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bride, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties and tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves so that it will be easier for you and they will bear the burden with you. In other words, Moses was to appoint trusted leaders to share in the responsibilities of ministry so that actually the people we better serve, they don't have to wait from morning till night just to spend five minutes with Moses, you know. And so that Moses himself wouldn't burn out. And so we realize that here in, in verse 3, that, they, that, that uh, the apostles said, ask them to pick out seven men of good repute. There was a need to do what Moses did in that sense. But these men to be, will be to be full of the spirit of wisdom and appoint them to this task of serving tables. Some of us may ask, you know, why, why seven men? Why seven men? Uh, it was actually a, more of a Jewish practice at that point in time. That they had committees, whenever they had committees, they would often make them uh, uh, up of seven people, okay? Uh, and the mathematicians among us would realize this quickly. The practical benefit is that whenever, if they have a dispute, they can 
vote lah, seven odd numbered. <laughs> okay, so it's a very practical reason why they chose seven men. Uh, but these seven men had, had to be highly qualified. Um, they had to have a good reputation. They had to be full of the Spirit and they had to be wise. And so w- when we look at this today, we might think that oh, these are qualities you look for uh, when we're choosing someone for very spiritual roles, right? Oh, to, 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 to wait on tables, uh, you need to to, to sort out these things, you need to be, uh, have a good reputation, be filled with the Spirit, uh, be very wise. And verses 5 and 6 tell us that they did even more. After they chose these seven men, they set these men before the apostles. And what did they do? They prayed and laid hands on them. What does this remind you of? This is almost like a, a, an ordination service, you know, <laughs> right? Like you lay hands on them and commission them. Like a prayer service uh, when people send out missionaries, you know, you lay, in, in Acts 13, they fasted and prayed and laid hands and sent out missionaries. And, and so these seven men were set apart and commissioned through prayer and the laying on of hands in order to serve this ministry of practical needs. Uh, what's, what's the point here? Am I saying that? Okay, later on, after service, we line up our hospitality team, our ushers, our tech team, those helping in administration, and so we lay hands on them after service. Uh, maybe we should, but, but that's not the point of this. I think the point that we are to realize is that the ministry of meeting practical needs, the ministry of meeting practical needs was seen as a very important spiritual role in the early church. The ministry of meeting practical needs was seen as a very important spiritual role. Nowadays, we kind of think, oh, certain things are spiritual, certain things are, are, are not spiritual. Lah, you know. But we realized in the early church, they saw the meeting of practical needs as a very spiritual role. Uh, it was seen, it was given a high priority and seen as a very spiritual task. These men need to be filled with the Spirit to do it. And so today, I think we should uh, shift our mindset a bit uh, and we should learn to see it this way, you know. Because in our culture, we sometimes value, we think of certain things as very spiritual and things are not. But, but in, in Scripture, in this example here, these things, even practical matters, are seen as very spiritual. And so if God has called you to serve uh, in, in a practical way, called you to serve in a ministry, in meeting practical needs, uh, recognize and remember, you know, that you are serving the Lord and it is a very spiritual and important duty. Amen? For some of, uh, for, for, and, and we look at this, we realize for some of the seven, uh, it, was the be- it was a beginning of an even more fruitful or, or even more fruitful ministry in that sense. As, as some of these men uh, were willing to humble themselves and allow God to use them in practical ministry, some of them were actually called, later on, later on, they were called and anointed by God to what we call uh, uh, the fivefold ministry in the ministry of God's Word in, in Ephesians 4. And in Ephesians 4, the Apostle Paul wrote and reminded us that he, meaning Jesus, uh, gave the apostles, the prophets, the, the evangelists, the shepherds or pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry and for building up the body of Christ. Uh, the verses before this in, uh, in Ephesians 4 tell us that these functions are graces or gifts given by Jesus for the benefit of the church. In other words, these are um, not ministries that we choose for ourselves, but these are roles which God shapes a person. God calls, uh, God shapes, gifts, and calls a person into. Of course, a person, if, if, if they were called in that way, the person has to respond and to choose. But their role will be to equip the saints. In other words, to help train others to do the work of ministry and not to do everything themselves. 
And so there are two, among these seven, right, there are two men in particular who stood out among them. And the first we realize is this man uh, named Stephen. And even, and it's specifically noted again that he's a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Earlier on, I already said these seven are full of the Spirit, but Stephen specifically, again, full of the Holy, Holy Spirit. It's almost like this guy was uh, doubly anointed, so to speak. But from this role of, of, of serving tables, he very quickly began to minister powerfully as he reached others for Christ. Uh, later on in this chapter, we are told that he was witnessing for Jesus. In this same chapter, in chapter 6, he, we are told that he was witnessing for Jesus and working signs and wonders. God anointed him with signs and wonders among the people. Uh, the unfortunate side of this is that, like Jesus, uh, Stephen was falsely accused by those who were jealous of him. And he became the first martyr of the church. But many people believe that he, Stephen would have been one of the successors to the 12 apostles if he had not died early. The second person among these seven is, is, really, is Philip, it's the second person in the list. And, and Philip eventually became known as Philip the Evangelist. He was used powerfully of God as an evangelist and he was the man whom God used in Acts chapter 8 to baptize the Ethiopian eunuch. Remember that? Acts chapter 8, God used him to baptize the Ethiopian eunuch. And many people believe that that act of his marked the introduction of the gospel into the continent of Africa. God used him in a sense to release the gospel uh, in, into that region. My, my point of, of presenting all of this uh, is, is not to get us to uh, look at or, or cover a particular function or role, but to help us see the way which God builds up His church in the New Testament. Okay, I'm not... Uh, the, it's to help us see the way that God builds His church in the New Testament. It's more to help us to see how God uniquely shapes God uniquely shapes, He graciously gives, and He sovereignly calls us to serve in different ministries to build up His church. God shapes, gives, and calls us to serve in different functions to build His church. We are told in the Scriptures that each one in the body of Christ has been given a gift to serve others with. For most of us, He calls us to serve Him in practical ways, and, but we are told that those roles, don't forget, are very important and very spiritual. And yet for some among the group, you know, God in His mysterious sovereignty calls them to function in the ministry of His Word or in the fivefold ministry. They too have to prove themselves to be called, chosen and faithful. And as Paul, uh, Paul David Tripp, a uh, writer, once said, you know, you probably don't want to do this if God hasn't called you because it's a dangerous calling. Uh, but no, the one thing we need to remember that is that all of these people, all of these people, okay, are to be servants and servant leaders. Even the apostles were called to be servants, which we will see shortly. But all of these roles are meant to build God's church and to expand the work of the gospel. The third aspect as we think about this idea of multiplying God's word is the ministry of word and prayer. The ministry of word and prayer. What's interesting uh, about this is that the, apostle, uh, the, the writer of Acts highlights that both the apostles and the seven men were servants. So they said in verse 2, it is not right that we should give up the preaching of the word of God to serve tables, but we will devote ourselves to the ministry of the word. It's not as clear in our English translations, but this would have been very clear uh, to Luke's original readers as they heard it or read it in the original language. Uh, Luke actually does so uh, by using the same root word in verses 2 when he writes of serving tables 
and in verse 4, when he writes about ministering God's word. These seven men were appointed to serve tables, uh, diaconin. These were appointed to serve tables, but the apostles were focused on the ministry or diaconia of the word. Okay? These seven men were appointed to serve tables, but the, the apostles were focused on the diaconia of the word. So this is the same rule, it will be very clear to the original listeners, they would have caught it immediately, that the seven men were appointed to serve tables, but the apostles were to focus on serving God's word. Okay? The seven men were appointed to serve tables, but the apostles were to focus on serving God's word. Both groups were servants, just that they had different roles. And so we remember, uh, we, many of us can remember as we think about this, this idea of why the apostles had to focus on the prayer and the word. That at the very beginning of the church uh, in Acts, the early church was called to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and the word of God in Acts chapter 2. There was something they kept their focus on. But we realize that in Acts chapter 6, we get the sense uh, and, and that there was pressure on the apostles to focus less on God's word and to spend more time in the practical ministry of the church. We know that it wasn't that practical ministry was unimportant, but the issue here has to do with God's priority and God's calling for the apostles of the church. Uh, the apostles' ministry was that they would devote themselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And it's very interesting that the word for devote here uh, is the same word they use in Acts chapter 2. They were to devote themselves to prayer and the word. And it really means to occupy yourself with something, to pay persistent attention to something. It's something that required diligence and focused attention. In other words, it was a spiritual work, but it was no less tiring or time-consuming than physical labor. In other words, the apostles were saying, what we committed at the start of the church, at the birth of the church to do, we must continue to do. And we see the results of this in verse 7. It says, the word of God continued to increase. The word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And more than that, you realize this, a great many of the priests, the most unlikely to come to the faith in that sense, a great number, many of the priests became obedient to the faith. As the word of God increased, the number of disciples also increased. And, we, and as we put all of this together, we realize that the picture in Acts chapter 6 is that of a unified body working together for God's mission. Each one serving and contributing in his or her rightful place. I invite us to notice something unusual here in chapter 7. Uh, and with this, I invite the worship team uh, back up. In chapter 7, uh, uh, rather in verse 7, there's something unusual here when we talk about uh, how the church grew. In next chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, they said there were added to that day 3,000 to the church. In two, chapter 2, verse 47, the Lord added to their number day by day. In chapter 4, the number of men came to about 5,000. In chapter 5, believers were added to the Lord. At the start of chapter 6, the disciples were increasing, right? But the end at, chapter, at verse 7, when all these things were put in place, it says that the number of disciples were not added. They were multiplied greatly. Why multiplied? Because the church understood some of these things that we talked about today. They understood that they needed to reach and accommodate different cultures. They understood that new servant leaders needed to be added as the church grew. 
faithful men needed to be appointed. And they knew that the word of God and prayer could not be compromised upon. When these things were organized rightly in place, God poured out an even greater blessing than before. Amen? But each of us have to play our part. I'm going to read for us 1 Peter chapter 4 as we conclude. It's not on the screen. I'm going to read for us 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 7 to 11 as I conclude today. 1 Peter says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. All these things you see in Acts 6. Verse 10, As each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's favorite grace. Whoever speaks, speak as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves, serve as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belongs glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I invite us to rise.